All right, so we have been talking about in the last few class periods, this constitutional convention that took place in 1787 in Philadelphia. Why did they get together at this constitutional convention? Mainly to revise the Articles of Confederation because they were weak. They wanted to create a stronger federal government. They wanted to create a new constitution that was going to help cure the illnesses that were created by the Articles of Confederation. And so at this convention, we have two political groups arise. And politics, again, that's one of your vocab words, is how you think or how you, where you stand on certain issues. So we had the Federalists who believed in a strong federal government. They wanted a new constitution. And they felt that uh, by doing this, the country's problems were going to be dealt with and, and hopefully eradicated or erased. Opposing them were a group called the Anti-Federalists. And we already went through these notes, so that's why I'm kind of flying through these first few slides. So Anti-Federalists, remember, anti means opposing or the opposite of. So they were the um, opposite of the Federalists. So Federalists wanted a, a new constitution. Anti-Federalists were opposed to a new constitution. They were afraid it was going to give too much power to the government and create what was essentially going to be another king. The Anti-Federalists wanted a limited or a weak federal government, whereas Federalists wanted a strong federal government. Anti-Federalists believed that more power should be in the hands of each individual state. And they felt this new constitution would take power away from the states. They feared another England. And they wanted written guarantees of certain rights that every individual has. While Federalists said, well, that's why we're writing this new constitution, those rights will pretty much be implied. So if you read this new constitution, you'll understand that the people have more rights than what they did when we were subjects of England. And the Anti-Federalists said, oh, no, 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 we've heard that before. Um, kings in the past and leaders in the past have said, we'll take care of you, but then they end up not doing so. So we want it in writing. So that way um, there's, the government's hands would be tied and they can't trample our freedoms and our liberties. So there were two plans that were devised during this constitutional convention. The first one is known as the Virginia plan, and this plan favored the large states. And I put that in parentheses or in quotations because it doesn't mean the size of the state in terms of area, land area. We're talking in terms of population. So largely populated states like Virginia, New York, Massachusetts, they liked this Virginia plan. So let's figure out why. First of all, this plan called for a strong federal government with three branches. There would be the legislative branch, which would make the laws, the executive branch, which would enforce the laws and make sure that the laws were being upheld and followed, and then a judicial branch, which did not exist under the Articles of Confederation, that would interpret the laws and settle disputes between states or individuals. So if you recall, under the Articles of Confederation, there was a legislative group, a group of lawmakers, uh, a Congress. Uh, however, they didn't really have the power to do a whole lot. So the laws that they created would govern or were aimed to govern the whole country, but each individual state had the power to be sovereign. And what I mean by that is they could kind of govern themselves. So states like Georgia and um, you know, Rhode Island could look at these federal laws and say, yeah, no, that doesn't suit us. We're just gonna do what we want. Uh, there was really no executive branch. There was no president. Now, they did have a ceremonial president, somebody who was kind of like, yeah, this guy is going to be the go-to person if you have any questions, but they didn't have nearly the power or influence that the president has today or the presidents that have served since the new constitution was written. And like I said, there was no judicial branch. There were no court systems. So this was a big bonus in the Virginia plan. The Virginia plan called for weakened state power. So they said, we need to give more power to the federal government and not so much power to the state governments. And again, we gave that example of, you need to have kind of a hierarchy. So think about your school system. The principal has the majority of the, the authority, but teachers have certain authorities as well within their classroom, but there's no teacher or there's no classroom that outranks the principal. So if the principal makes a, a decision that's gonna be what's best for the students and for the school, that's what's gonna happen. And so in the Virginia plan, they said our federal government needs to be set up this way where the federal government has the final say as long as they can prove that it's for the good of the people. Now they called for a bicameral legislature and the prefix bi means two of something, all right? So think of like a bicycle, bifocals, uh, two lenses to help you see better. Anytime a word or most times when a word starts with the letters bi, it refers to that there's two of something. 
So in the Virginia plan, they said, let's create two lawmaking houses um, based on population. And what that means is they said, states that have more people should get more votes and states that have fewer people should get fewer votes. And their rationale was these large populated states have more issues that come up. There, there's more problems that arise. And so therefore they should get more votes and they should have a little bit more authority in Congress than those lesser populated states, all right? Um, and think about a classroom. So typically in a smaller class, if you're in a class of about five or six students, there's not as many discipline issues. There's not as many uh, distractions in that class. Whereas if you're in a class, if you've ever been in a class of like 33, 34, 35 people, sometimes you, you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, it's so chaotic in here. And it's not that the students are bad, it's just that um, there's a lot of issues that have to be dealt with. And so that's what supporters of the Virginia plan felt was, let's reward those states that have a higher population and give them a little bit more power in Congress. Smaller states, however, thought this plan was too much like Britain, giving too much power to the federal government. So as you can imagine, Federalists were a supporter of this Virginia plan. Anti-Federalists said, we need a different plan. So they came up with one of their own known as the New Jersey plan. And the reason it was called the Virginia New Jersey plan is the, the delegates that proposed each of these, the one who proposed the Virginia plan was from the state of Virginia, and the one who proposed the New Jersey plan was from the state of New Jersey, okay? So Edmund Randolph was the Virginia guy, and William Patterson was the New Jersey guy, if you're looking for trivia facts there. Then that, now the New Jersey plan also called for three branches of government split up, uh, separate but equal powers, just like the Virginia plan called for. And those three branches would, again, be a legislative group to make the laws, a, an executive group to enforce the laws, and a judicial group to make sure that the laws are being followed and to interpret the laws. So in the New Jersey plan, they said the states would maintain their power. So the New Jersey plan really called for something similar to the Articles of Confederation, where states had more power than the federal government. They, however, said, we don't need two lawmaking groups because anytime you have more than one of something, there's the opportunity for um, dissension and disagreement. So let's just have one housemaking body or one uh, lawmaking house, I should say. And that's what's known as a unicameral. So think of the words that start with uni, okay? So unicorn, one horn on its head, a unicycle, one wheel, a unibrow, okay? Like Anthony Davis in the NBA, um, one eyebrow going across, right? Um, so Unicameral means that there would only be one group that makes the laws and every state, regardless of population, would get one vote. So the New Jersey plan was all about equal representation, regardless of whether you have more people or not. And think about it. If you are um, in a class and the teacher says, okay, anybody who has more than one sibling, um, then you get an extra two weeks to turn in your homework. Anybody who's uh, got just one sibling, or if you're an only child, your homework is due tomorrow. If you are somebody who uh, is an only child or has one sibling, you're going to think, well, wait a minute, why do they get special treatment? Even if the teacher says, well, because they've got a lot of people in their family and there's more distractions and more disruptions, so I'm taking it easier on them. You, as an individual, um, do not have control over how big your family is, just like states and state delegates don't have control over how many people are living in their state. They are confined by people's choices, but also by area. So a smaller state like Rhode Island would naturally have a lesser population than a larger area state like Virginia, just because Rhode Island in size is very small. So they felt that everybody should be treated equally because that's really what our country was founded upon. And so what we're gonna get into next time is looking at which of these two plans kind of won or did they take a, a little bit from each plan and create a compromise?